Welcome back, everyone. So it's my pleasure to be introducing a, a colleague and collaborator, uh, Angelos Georgiou. Uh, I think I've known Angelos since uh, more than five or six years now, when we met in the ETH Zurich. <laughs> uh, he's currently assistant professor at the Department of Business and Public Administration at University of Cyprus. Prior to that, he was much closer to me at uh, McGill University as assistant professor of operations management this hotel faculty of management uh, he's, he's been involved in a lot of different areas in particular uh, methods for stochastic and robust optimization problems uh, but he has a special interest for energy problems and uh, operations management and healthcare well uh, angela it's a real pleasure for me to have you um, you <laughs> well, <laughs> i followed your careers well. for five years i really enjoy all your presentation. Uh, it's, it, well, there was no doubt in my mind that you were a great speaker to invite to our workshop. So he, the floor Thank you is very much. I, I really, I'm really thankful for the opportunity. And uh, you have done a great uh, workshop. I really enjoyed it. So today I'm going to talk about, um, I call it robust optimization with adjustable uncertainty sets. Is essentially I'm going to consider problems and robust problems where the uncertainty set is also an optimization variable. Now, typically uh, people refer to this as decision dependent, problems with decision dependent uncertainty sets. I called it uh, adjustable uncertainty sets uh, in line with what uh, Professor Vital Nemirovsky called the adjustable uh, policies. And I will show you why uh, later on. So instead of uh, showing you the theory that we use uh, and show you how to handle the problem, I choose a different path. I chose to I would present three different problems, a frequency reserve provision problem, a network control problem, and an inverse optimization setting, where in all three, actually, they use uh, pretty much the same methodology, but uh, it's completely different in nature of the problems. So let me start with frequency reserve, uh, reserve provision. So the problem looks a bit like this. So in an energy system, typically it works a bit like this. On the one hand, we have the generators, like conventional or renewable generators. And on the other hand, we have the consumers, us. We use electricity for our everyday uh, chores. And uh, in the middle sits uh, the system operator that tries to manage the two. In particular, if the demand is high, then it needs to phone a generator and tell him, hey, can you increase your uh, power output? And uh, the generator does. And uh, that's how essentially we achieve uh, energy balance in the system. Now, with the addition of more uh, renewable energies and the fact that we cannot really predict their output, uh, there is an increasing need for spinning reserves. What does that mean? Spinning reserve is literally, as the same suggests, like a spare generator that spins. Essentially, it has the momentum to deliver energy if needed. And if the power from the renewables, so let's say, drops, then the system operators goes to the spinning reserve and ask him, can you now produce more electricity? Or the reverse, like decrease your um, production so that we can uh, manage the system. And the idea in this project is if uh, to ask uh, to, to figure out if uh, we can do the same thing with demand response, so essentially change the, the demand behavior of consumers to achieve uh, the energy balance. And we're going to do this essentially by utilizing the fact that buildings consume a lot of uh, energy, especially for heating and cooling. Now, obviously, to provide this uh, reserve, uh, you get paid. And typically you get paid from the secondary energy market where these uh, reserves are traded. And the way it works is a bit uh, as follows. The building will have some nominal consumption. This is like the forecast throughout the 24 hours in the day. And the building will sell to the system operator a reserve capacity. I denote the reserve capacity by essentially this gap here. And uh, this is for every hour in the 24 hours of the day. Now, essentially, this reserve capacity says that the building is willing to deviate from its nominal consumption 
to some other consumption, either increasing consumption or decreasing consumption. The reserve is, uh, is declared, is sell to the system operator at uh, midnight, let's say, and it's fixed and essentially commits to it for the next 24 hours. Now, in real time now, the system operator needs, uh, you know, um, it has excess electricity. So it calls the building and says, can you increase your, your consumption? And so the consumption goes up or decrease your consumption and uh, it goes down. So the building needs to follow the, essentially the request that the operators uh, make within the reserve capacity that they have sold to the grid. The problem essentially can be formulated from the building's perspective. The problem can be formulated as follows. Uh, you want to optimize essentially your costs and your revenues. So I denote by W the reserve capacity that we sell, the building sells to the grid. And the more reserve capacity it will sell, the more money it will receive. So here I'm minimizing the minus my reward. Essentially, I'm maximizing the money that I get from selling this reserved capacity to the grid. Now, obviously, the building has other you know, requirements that it needs to follow. It has you know, the temperature set points need to be satisfied. So P, pi here, it's the policy that uh, the building needs to, how to operate the building, right? You have the, your, and the building constraints need to be satisfied. The actuation constraints is to be satisfied. It's not like you can burn infinite amount of electricity in the building if needed. And all of this needs to be satisfied for all possible, possible reserve requests that you get from the building, uh, from the um, grid operator. And as you see here, both the reserve capacity, W, and the policy are decision variables. So this is why we call it a decision dependent, it's a decision dependent uncertainty model. Now you can think of this a bit like selling insurance. So W is uh, essentially the, con the, con the insurance, the amount of insurance that you sell, like the volume of the insurance. The more insurance you sell, the more money that you're going to get. But at the same time, when things uh, materialize, if uh, people uh, you know, complain and they have accidents or whatever, you need to be feasible. So it's uh, somewhat in the same uh, line of thought. So let's formulate the problem. So this is the problem that I will attempt to solve. Um, it's a multi-stage robust optimization problem where the, uh, the multi-stage behavior it's uh, hidden within this uh, policy here. And uh, the difficulty comes as any multi-stage uh, robust optimization problem comes from the fact that we need to optimize over policies, comes from the fact that we need to optimize now over the sets, W, the uncertainty sets. Well, in the objective, we need to somehow measure a, a metric of this set. You can think of row as mapping it's essentially calculating the volume of the set. Other uh, metrics can also be used. Lambda, you can think of it as the money that you get per unit of volume that you sell. And as I said earlier, we need to satisfy our constraints robustly for all uh, realizations within W. Now, let me try to tell you how we solve this problem. I will split the problem in two. In my first attempt, I will only consider optimization over the W set, and then I will come back and put the policy. So here is the problem we are optimizing over W. Now, here is the approximation that I'm gonna do. So I will, my approximation will start by choosing a primitive set, a simple set as I call it. It's, as the name, the name suggests, is some simple looking convex set. Think of it like a box or an ellipsoid or the intersection like a polyhedral set, some convex uh, set. And the approximation that I'm gonna make is that I will restrict the W to be an affine function of this simple set. And now the optimization variables in the problem will be the matrix Y and this little vector Y. The matrix Y is responsible, if you think about it, for scaling this set and rotating this set. And vector y is responsible for the translation of the set 
in the space. So, uh, and since I, I told you earlier that uh, a possible row could be the maximizing the void yoke, we could choose the log determinant of the matrix bar. So here is the approximation, I plugged it in. But still now you see that it's decision dependent on certainty. I still have decisions Y in the right hand side of uh, my constraint, that's not good. So I, I, oh, I rewrite this problem here. But if you notice, I can just redefine my W vector, the little W vector to be just the vector uh, that is defined as follows, is uh, the linear mapping, but now is the vector S, which is an element of the simple set. And this is just a robust optimization, a static robust optimization. So this approximation allows me to go from optimizing essentially over arbitrary sets to optimizing over a fine transformation of some choice of simple sets, some primitives, okay? Now I come and I plug in back my policy. I apply my approximation as I have shown you. Now, remember this is a multi-stage problem. All the multi-stage stuff is hidden in this uh, constraint here. And I'm gonna do the following trick. I'm gonna rewrite the W vector as I, as I did before. And for the policy pi, I'm just gonna redefine it to some other policy pi tilde to be a function of S. And in the paper, we show that actually these two problems are equivalent. So why do I care? Because the, the problem below is literal, a multi-stage robust optimization problem without independent of the uh, uncertainties that there is not a decision dependent the answer. So now, since it's a multi-stage robust optimization problem, I can pick my favorite solution method like a dynamic programming or just approximation through decision rules. Here I chose a fine decision rules and I can solve it efficiently. So here is the main trick of uh, the, the idea of how to handle decision dependent uncertainty. So let me show you quickly a numerical uh, example. So here we consider um, a building, the building dynamics are given here. You don't have to worry too much about the notation. And uh, as I described before in my introduction, uh, we sell result capacities for this particular problem. The, the W you said is actually symmetric. So you, serve, uh, you sell up reserve and down reserve and the, um, the reserve capacity is symmetric. So it's minus Y and Y. Um, and for this reason, Actually, the simple set can just be the minus one hypercube, and the W could just be a linear transformation of this set Y. Now, the objective, the row, I chose to be the sum of the Ys. So essentially the sum of the volume is not really a volume, it's like the width of the, the radius of the set that I'm, I'm selling. But actually this is what's happening in the reserve uh, capacity market. And lambda is the amount of money that I get in respect of the policy. So pi is the, um, the price of electricity that the, um, the building buys its energy. Uh, and uh, here are the constraints that the, um, the building needs to uh, satisfy. By the way, I forgot to mention that you can also add exogenous uncertainty the problem doesn't really change. In fact, my next application has exogenous uncertainty in it. Nothing really uh, changes. So we solve the problem using linear decision rules on top of this approximation, which is not really an approximation in our case, because actually this is how you, you sell the reserve capacity. So here are some results. So on top, I have a typical profile for a weekday, so we have the price of electricity uh, and the time of the day. On the bottom graph, I have the capacity, reserve capacity that the building cell, uh, sells as a function of the lambda. Remember, lambda is the amount of money that you get from selling the capacity. So you can think of it, if they give you like huge sums of money, like on this end, 
So you want to sell as much capacity as possible. So the building can sell up to this amount of capacity. And the reason is it has so much actuation capacity, so much energy uh, storage in the building. Okay, so you see an increase in profile as uh, the reward uh, increases, makes sense. So here is the profile for a weekend. So on the weekend, the price of electricity is typically uh, cheaper. And you see here the uh, profile for the uh, reserve capacity that you sell. And the interesting part here is that in the weekends, you typically sell more reserve capacity. Makes sense, the price of electricity is cheaper. But what is more interesting is actually this area here, where actually in the weekday, you are willing to sell to sell a reserve for um, a smaller reward uh, function, reward uh, lambda. So, and the reason is because in the weekday you have higher fluctuation in the price. So you are better off selling a reserve capacity even if you don't get um, enough money. The second experiment that we did is that we took the reserve capacity as a function again of the lambda that I showed you in the previous uh, slide. And then we asked ourselves how much electricity the building will actually consume. So with the red line is the electricity that it will consume if no request as, uh, is asked from the system operator. The blue is if the system operator constantly calls the, um, the building and asking to increase its consumption and green is to decrease constantly its consumption. Now, what I found interesting here is that actually you tend to consume a lot of electricity, a lot of electricity, look at this. So if you don't sell any capacity, you, you consume way less electricity than if you sell the capacity. And this is very counterintuitive to me because essentially we do all this to save electricity, right? But then I thought about it and that's actually, the spinning reserves role and the spinning reserve also consumes electricity to maintain to be ready right so in some sense what's happening here is that the building essentially operates in the middle of the window so imagine if the set point of the temperature is from 20 to 25 degrees the building operates at 22.5 degrees so it's able to move upwards or downwards to maximize the potential of uh, so it essentially spends electricity to be at the optimum level. So the idea is, okay, we are not, we are still wasting some energy, but at least we don't need to buy this extra generator to operate the system. So this was the main idea from the first paper, and these are my author. The second um, chapter that I want to touch upon is network control. So this is somewhat different. So it's still an energy application. Imagine that you have a building community that shares some expensive components of uh, like uh, solar panels and heat pumps and batteries and whatnot. And the aim is to minimize the total energy consumption. Okay, so that's fine. I can formulate a multi-stage problem and solve it and I will minimize the total energy consumption. However, you, in order to do that, essentially, everybody in the, um, in the network kind of need to share their uh, states and essentially say when they're gonna be in the building and when they're gonna be out of the building and so on. So in some sense, there's no privacy. There is a, every, all of the agents are coupled together within this uh, single optimization problem. So the idea is, can we do better? Can we solve, minimize the total energy consumption, but essentially have some sort of um, decoupled uh, structure. So here is our uh, uh, formulation. I have M agents, I have linear dynamics. So let's say I take agent two, here is the state of agent two and uh, agent two gets affected by agent one. Here is the state of agent one. It has its control input and some exogenous uh, uncertainty that affects uh, agent two and so on. This is all finite horizon by Okay, so in the centralized uh, way that I, I told you before, what you will do is effectively everybody communicates with everybody. That means that the policy of all agents are function of the states 
of all other agents. Okay, this is what I call a centralized information exchange. I can formulate the problem, right? This is what we will typically do. Um, great, it turns out that the problem is not convex because the policy is a function of the state, but due to the work of Goulart and his co-author uh, uh, during his PhD, we know that actually we can rewrite this policy as a function of the uh, random variables, the uncertain parameters in the problem. And actually now the problem is convex and we can solve it using our favorite uh, solution. Problems. The problem is monolithic, so it's very dense. It has no decoupling structure. And as I said, it doesn't promote privacy. Now, there is another uh, halfway method to this. This is called a partial nested information exchange. And essentially it takes advantage of the structure of the network. So if you notice here, agent one affects the others, but doesn't affect, uh, is not affected by anyone else. So his policy, it's only a function of his own state. Agent two get, gets affected by agent one. So his policy is a function of agent one and agent uh, two. Agent three gets affected from agent two, which is in turn affected by agent one. So his policy is a function of one, two, three, uh, and five, and so on. So this is what's called a partial nested information exchange. And we can still write the problem down. Here is the policy with all the nested president uh, agents. The problem is still not convex, but using the same trick that Gulag developed, we can formulate it as a, a, a convex problem where the policy is a function of the uncertainty. And here again, you can solve it with your favorite method. However, still there is a monolithic structure and still it doesn't promote enough privacy, I will argue. We want to take a different road. We want the information to match exactly the structure of the network. We don't need, we don't want extra uh, links, if you like. So in order to do that, I'm going to explain it with a simple example. So imagine the, um, a simple network, you have two agents, agent one and agent two. And in this setting, well, in the centralized setting, if you like, agent one declares to agent two, if you like, state, Agent two takes it, plugs it into his dynamics, it says, thank you. And they both go on and optimize the problem. Now imagine the situation that agent one wants to be cautious. He doesn't want to relieve exactly the functional form you like of the state. So what he does is he computes a set. I call it, it's a calligraphic X set. I call it a state forecast set, which essentially encloses the future states of agent one. Okay, so it's, it's kind of saying, hey, in uh, at um, 5 p.m., my energy consumption will be between this and this bound. At 6 p.m., my energy consumption will be between this and this bound. So it's a set, okay? Now, agent one shows it this to agent two. Agent two, okay, takes it and he says, what am I gonna do with it, right? It's a set, it's not a functional form. I cannot really plug it in to my dynamics, it's a set. So agent two, it uh, becomes a bit conservative and treats the states of agent one like it will treat any uncertain vector. It treats it like uncertain. So it considers its dynamical system. Now agent, agent one will appear as, uh, as a, like an adversarial agent that uh, he could consider the worst case behavior, if you like. So I can take this problem, I can formulate my optimization problem. Now I want to, again, emphasize that this is not a game. It's a single optimization problem. I want to minimize the sum of the energy consumption. So here are the constraints of the problem. I will uh, break it up. So here is agent one. Okay, so here is dyna his dynamics. Here is his constraints. And here is where he optimizes over set calligraphic X. So he computes a set where his states belong to, okay? Now, agent two, here is agent two. Here is his dynamics. Here is where typically state one will appear. Now, instead of state one, he treats it as uncertain. So this set X1 now becomes the random uh, uncertain vector Z1. And I need to satisfy it for all realizations within this set. 
Okay. The policy is as follows. So agent one has only a policy, it's a policy of all these states, and agent two, it's a policy of its states and this uncertain vector Z1. And these are essentially the decision variables in the problem together with the, the set that I am optimizing over. Now, if you notice, this is a decision dependent on certainty. Well, it's not really uncertainty, but this state, this set X is really an uncertain quantity that appears here and here, okay? So this fits within this decision dependent uh, setting. So the optimization problem is like a balancing act, if you like. Agent one here wants this set to be as large as possible. Why? Because if it's as large as possible, he will not pose any constraints in, in his own objective. So he will minimize unilaterally his objective. But agent two will suffer. Agent two wants the uncertainty set to be as small as possible because he doesn't want uh, un, you know, excess uncertainty in his system. So it's a balancing act, if you like, between the two agents. By the way, this was not present in the frequency reserve position where essentially this balancing act, it was appearing in the term in the objective, the reward. But essentially the reward wanted the set to be as large as possible. However, the constraints wanted the, uh, the, um, the uncertainty set to be as small as possible. Okay, so in this setting, this is the balancing act. Utsav has its uh, hands raised, but per perhaps I can take this question. Yeah, so uh, who, who is solving this problem, like the summation of, why, why would, yes. So in principle, still they are solving it together. So in principle, uh, they want to minimize the total energy consumption. You can think of this as um, uh, a central operator wants to solve this problem. Now, hang on a second and uh, let me add and I will come back to this. So the problem is actually almost decoupled. The only one second, uh, Sven, I will, uh, I'll take your question in a second. The, the problem is almost decoupled here. The only thing that links the two agents is this set calligraphic X. Now, if it wasn't for that set X, the two agents will have completely decoupled problems. And actually we take advantage of this. And we, in the revision of the paper right now, we are developing an ADMM algorithm where essentially agent one solves its own problem with a copy of X1 and H, agent two solved his own problem with again a copy of X2. And essentially they reach consensus only on this set X1. And the rest of the dynamics and the constraints remain private to the two uh, agents. Okay, Sven? My question is uh, maybe simpler. What does it mean to have an equality constraint defining a trajectory X2 for an infinite number of psi one. This is a function. Psi one. It's a function. It, oh, so it's a function, function of a function psi two. Psi one. Of it's course, a it's a function of z one and psi two. Oh, and okay. Here it's a function of psi one. Okay, my yeah. notation is not that great, but Got it. it will yeah. be um, a lot cumbersome. Uh, yeah, it's not. It's not deterministic. It's a function, like uh, what Professor Powell said in his presentation. Just make it a function. Make it a policy. So this problem here actually is a conservative approximation of the partially nested information exchange, which is a conservative approximation of the centralized information exchange. So essentially what we're doing here is we are um, approximate the problem by introducing this, um, these sets. So theorem, the, the problem is not convex in general because these are function of the states, but similarly to the rest, we can transform it to a convex problem um, where the policies are function to the um, uncertain parameters in the problem. So still we need to deal with this uh, set C, right? Uh, still here, it's a power set, so it's any set. So we still need to deal with that. And as before, I'm gonna do the same trick. I'm gonna choose a primitive simple set S, right? Think of it like a box or an ellipsoid or whatever, right? And I will restrict my admissible sets to be affine functions of this set. 
right? And I'm gonna do exactly the same trick as before. Here is uh, the problem and I'm gonna apply my approximation to, to the problem. Still, it's, a pro it's problematic because alpha and beta which is responsible for the scaling and the, and the translation of the set appears um, in the right hand side. So alpha and beta are decision variables in the problem. So, but I can do again the same trick. I can just eliminate it by plugging in. And now the uncertainty is with respect to S. Uh, the problems are shown to be equivalent, right? They're as before in the frequency reserve position. So I'm not losing, I'm not making further approximations. So this is why do I care? Because the latter problem is just a multi-stage robust optimization problem. And again, you can solve it using your favorite method. I'm choosing affine decision rules for the next example. Okay. So here is my simpli simplified model. I have a, um, a built-in uh, network, right? They share some uh, expensive components. And uh, I will choose my simple set to be just a rectangular sets, which I'm going to scale and translate as needed. Now, I solve a multi, I told you that this is a multi-stage problem. I solve a finite horizon problem of um, eight hours. And here I scale the number of buildings that appear in my network. And I show the total energy consumption for the building configuration, if you like. And the, the blue line shows the cost that is achieved by the centralized communication, while the red curve shows the cost that achieved by the, this local information uh, communication. As expected, because of the information approximation, essentially, the, the cost is higher. What I was uh, surprised is that the gap is not that large. So for this particular uh, application, actually you don't lose a lot of, um, essentially you don't uh, become too suboptimal uh, in your solution. What was also interesting to see is the solution time. As I told you, the problem is the, it's almost decoupled. The only thing that couples the agents is this set X. And depending on the network structure, this set X essentially, um, well, the, um, the problem is almost decoupled and this shows in the, um, in the optimization problem. So in the centralized uh, communication, the uh, increase in the number of buildings increases substantially the, the computation. While in the local communication, the optimization time actually remains relatively uh, small. So this brings me to the end of my second uh, application. And uh, for the third application, I talk about something completely different, inverse optimization. This is uh, uh, an ongoing project. So for those of you that uh, don't know what inverse optimization is, Eric is an expert on the field. As the name suggests, it's like reverse engineering an optimization problem. So imagine that uh, there is some optimization problem that I want to learn, for example, Eric is doing something uh, clever. I want to figure out what he's doing, right? In what, uh, if you like, in what, me what mechanisms he uses to do it. And uh, I can pose it, if you like, as an optimization problem. S is the input to this optimization problem. For example, uh, could be the demand or uh, some exogenous parameters that I can observe. And uh, X would be the output the decisions of the optimization problem. And theta is really the parameters of the optimization problem that I want to learn, okay? In inverse optimization literature, this is called the forward problem. Okay, so what shall I do? So as I told you, I observe essentially pairs of the signal and the output decisions of this optimization problem. So you can think of this optimization problem like a machine that takes an input and gives me an output. So the only thing I observe is this S and this X. So what do I do? Well, I send my trusted PhD student and uh, she records for different inputs and outputs what's going on, right? So I, I now I have a collection of data points, S1, X1, S2, X2, and so on, okay? 
And from this data, I will try to reverse engineer, if you like, this optimization tool. Now, in principle, I know nothing about this optimization, right? It's completely unknown to me. So I need to make some hypothesis, right? So with capital F and G will be the hypothesis class that I, I choose. So you can think of F is that I postulate that my objective has a linear or a quadratic form. Or G could be the uncertain, the, uh, sorry, the feasible region that is either polyhedral or ellipsoidal or whatever, right? And theta in both cases define the, you know, the parameters of this uh, hypothesis. So, okay, so this is the optimization problem that I will end up with after estimating. Now I need a way to actually estimate the problem. So I need to define a loss function, okay? So I want to find the best theta, right? That fits best within my data. This is, you can think of it like a learning problem. So the loss function that takes all the data that I collected uh, looks like this. Okay, it has two constraints. Now, before I move on, I want to go back a couple of slides here and point out that X is, um, it's the optimal decision of the problem. Now, what does it mean it's optimal? It means that first of all, it's feasible within the constraints and it's optimal. Okay, so when I come here, I better make sure that the theta that I find makes the X that I have observed feasible. Okay, and the second constraint says, you better make sure that the F that you find together with the G makes the X optimal. So the second constraint essentially says, uh, if I evaluate my objective, this capital F, my hypothesis objective with uh, the data point X that I have observed and compare this value to the value of optimizing over some auxiliary variable Y, uh, it's essentially, it's um, like a dummy optimization problem uh, that essentially mimics the optimization, the forward problem, right? I better make sure that uh, the objective is not a higher or a lot lower than what I achieve here. Now, if you notice there are these gammas here as well, right? Uh, it's like slack variables, which I penalize in the objective. So why do I need this? Well, if I go back again, when I make the hypothesis about the structure of my problem, it might be the case that uh, my hypothesis class is not rich enough. The original objective was, uh, you know, some crazy, may, maybe a quadratic function, but my hypothesis class is linear, or my constraints are ellipsoid, and my hypothesis class are polyhedral, right? So the gammas here are essentially hypo um, slack variables that allow me to violate these constraints if needed. In addition, the, the data points, the X and the S, might actually be noisy. So even if I have a rich enough uh, hypothesis class, I might not be able to capture the, the true behavior. So here is my loss. So where do decision dependent uncertainty fits within this framework? Well. If I look at this uh, second constraint here, I can rewrite it as follows. This minimization, I can make it a for all constraint. So here it is, becomes for all Y. And now immediately you see that this G, which is, if you remember, is the feasible region of my problem, appears both here and here. So essentially now this feasible region that I'm trying to find behaves kind of the decision dependent uncertainty that uh, I had in the previous applications. Well, great, I have a, a mechanism for dealing with it. So I will deal with it in the same way that uh, I dealt uh, with the rest. So I'm gonna propose that this G takes the following structure. It's, it looks a bit different than before, but it's actually the same. So I have this primitive set Z, that this is my like simple set that I had before and alpha and beta, which are the parameters theta of the constraint, essentially take this simple set, rotate it, translate it, and so on. Okay, so alpha is responsible, A is responsible for the rotating, the scaling, 
even the projection and bit for the translation. Okay, so let's, I take this, I plug it into my problem, right? I make the same tricks as before and I end up with my problem. Now I want to point out that this problem is non-convex because I have this non-linearity here, both alpha and Z uh, are decision variables in my problem. I will not focus too much on this. There is a further approximation that I can do to make this convex. But in general, this is not a super hard uh, problem. We are actually solving the bilinear problem uh, with different methods and we are getting very good results. So assume that uh, we are solving uh, this non-convex problem, okay? By the way, let me show you some uh, choices of the um, of the, set, the simple set, the primitive set, and what we can do with it. So here I show, imagine that you start with a, a box, you can rotate it, you can scale it, you can translate it, and this is will be the resulting, if you like, constraint set that you will have. Another possible set is actually the union of conver convex sets. So you can start with multiple uh, primitive sets and uh, the constraints will be the union of sets, interesting intersection of sets and hard, but union is uh, you can pose it as an MILP. And finally, if uh, the matrix A is actually a fat matrix, you can take a higher dimensional uh, primitive set and you can create complicated sets, constraints, uh, by projecting the set in a lower dimensional space. So you can think of it as starting with a simplex and the, the, uh, the dimension of the simplex could be uh, the thing that you control and you create like um, uh, elaborate um, sets. By the way, one thing that I will not show and I will show in numerical in a second, A could also be binary. And uh, this has some interesting applications as well. So I want to show you very two very simple example. The first one is trivial. It's a it's a two dimensional example. Uh, here is the problem, the forward problem. I assume that I know the objective, but I don't know the constraints. So in some sense, I'm trying to learn the constraints. The signal is in the type, essentially the the way the objective uh, behaves, and the, the constraints is this. It's actually the red. It's uh, the diamond shape uh, uh, problem. So I start with a primitive set, which is a box. It's the infinity norm. And in the noiseless case, where X is not contaminated by noise, actually the problem uh, finds the optimal solution. So you take the box, you rotate it, and exactly you can uh, get the correct uh, shape. In the noisy case, we don't. So the points that you see here are the measurements for X. They are noisy. And you see that the blue region, which is what we compute, is actually not exactly the red one, but it's actually pretty uh, close. The second application is a bit more involved. It's, uh, we are asking, can we learn the network structure of the network? And again, I'm gonna pick an energy project, an energy application. Imagine that I have a power network. As I assume I know the nodes of the network, the demands of the network. I also know the location and the capacity of the generators. So I know that this is connected to this and so on. And I also know the capacity of the transmission lines, but I don't know where the transmission lines are. Okay, so the aim is to figure out the structure of the network. My fourth word problem looks a bit like this. Um, the signal is the cost of generation. G is the amount of that I generate from my generators. And delta, which is uh, the demand of electricity at every node. So the first constraint is capacity, generation capacity that I assume I know. The second constraint is transmission capacity that I also assume I know F, but I don't know where the, uh, the links are. And the last constraint is the energy balance constraint, where essentially it's the conservation of energy if you like, which I assume I don't know completely, but I know where the demand happens at every node, okay? So the signal is the, the cost and the demand. The observed decision is the generation decisions and the flow decisions are actually latent variables that I don't observe at all. In this case, my hypothesis class can take the following, following form. My primitive set will essentially be the, 
the flow decisions, right? And, and my aim is not really to scale in order to translate it, but really to create the network structure. So this constraint essentially mimics this energy balance constraint. And essentially the matrices A plus and A minus are in binary, binary matrices that create the network. So A, A plus is uh, the incoming to the node and the A minus is the outcoming flow to the node. So they are binary variables. Actually, this problem can be cast as an MILP, right? The, the whole learning problem and solved relatively efficiently. So here are the results. So here is the original network where the flows are, uh, are given, like the, the connections are given, and this is the recovered network. Now, what is interesting here is that the two don't look at uh, the same. I interesting, the, in the learning problem, the cost was zero. So actually we are able, so this network behaves exactly the same in terms of cost as this network. So it's like there exists another network configuration that can achieve the same performance as this network. In fact, this is with one less um, uh, uh, link, um, but it works exactly the same. So I found that quite interesting. So you can recover, by the way, this, this connection was also part of the feasible uh, region, but you know, a simple structure was recovered. Okay, so this brings me to the end of the third part and the, the end of my talk uh, actually. And uh, what I would like to, as a take home message is that uh, typically decision dependent on certainty is considered a hard problem and it is a hard problem. However, if um, you can somehow to relax your modeling assumptions, like in our case, we start with simple sets and we don't do crazy manipulations of them. We just rotate them and translate and scale them or project them, right? You are able to actually handle it in many cases. And in many cases, the, uh, the treatment of these sets comes naturally. In fact, in the first two applications, the choice of the primitive sets was actually uh, dictated almost by the uh, problem itself. In the inverse optimization, you have the choice, what shall I choose, right? And uh, there you can, if you are a bit smart and you choose it uh, wisely, then you can um, have a, a good approximation. And uh, great, so I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, and I would be very happy to take uh, more questions. Thanks. Thank you, Angelas, for the great talk. Uh, I think the fact that you covered three different uh, problems <laughs> is attracting a lot of questions. Uh, uh, let me start from scratch. There was uh, Ilam Nahahuddin Shia that wrote in the chat at 1120, uh, something would come about several points. Is, is there something to comment there or question? So let me try to, uh, uh, thank you for your interesting lecture. I would like to confirm. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, please. Yeah. So uh, I just want to confirm a few things because I missed the explanation of the first three slides. So when you use the simple, and, sorry, uh, why did you treat the reserve capacity in the first uh, problems or presentations as an uncertainty quant uncertain quantity? Should it be something that is planned or willing to sacrifice the building order to be sold? I, I didn't understand your question. So the aim is really to optimize over the reserve capacity. So really, I'm, uh, I'm trying, my aim is really to optimize over W. So I am committing at the beginning of the day, right, to some W, and then throughout the day, I'm uh, essentially um, uh, operating my building. But in order to commit to that W, that set, I need to figure out a feasible W throughout the day. So you can think of this problem as something that you will solve at the beginning of the day to get your W, and once you have it, then you can fix it and just operate throughout the day your building. Is that okay? Uh, so the uncertainty is on the... Sorry. There is no real uncertainty here. I'm creating, oh, okay. in essence, my own uncertainty. Oh, I see, I see, okay. And then the, another thing that I'm curious that uh, this is the uncertainty set uh, approximations and use, use, let's say, the simple uncertainty as a starters. 
Yeah. What is the guarantee that the choice of the uh, set uh, the choice of the result or your uncertainty will be representative enough or at least work well with the integrated when it integrated to the true optimization problem? Perfect. So the choice of this primitive set. So in principle, I don't have a guarantee. Now, in the frequency reserve position, by construction, the reserves are a range. So if I consider a primitive set to be a box, in fact, I don't have any approximation. It's not really an approximation. That's how the, the problem behaves. Okay, so there is no approximation there. When it comes to the uh to the uh, to the control problem uh, the set can be anything really but uh, i i said that we want some privacy so in principle you don't want a super complicated set that uh, captures if you like a lot of correlation between the states so in principle there you also have want it to be simple like a range so having a box in this application as well, like a, a, a rectangle and only kind of scale it without rotating and doing crazy stuff with it, actually can provide some sort of uh, privacy uh, to the system. So there as well, the choice is a bit natural, if you like. For the inverse optimization, uh, you can take anything really. And there it's like you are guess of how um, the feasible region will look like, but uh, I cannot give you more guidelines on this on that one. Okay, thank you very much for your explanations. It's a bit like the question of why use a linear function in a linear regression. <laughs> yeah, it's a leap of faith at some point. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Any uh, so next, uh, Sven, do you have an additional question, or was your question answered already? No, so my other question was the these adjustable uncertainty sets, yep. um, they seem similar to saying the, if the uncertainty set could depend on the decision variables. So if I have decision variables X and my uncertainty set W depends on the set X, isn't that somewhat equivalent to having an adjustable uncertainty set? It's somewhat equivalent. Um, no, it's not somewhat equivalent, it's equivalent, uh, if you like. So if I go back to the, um, here it is. So it's like saying that W depends on Y, which is exactly what's yeah. going on. I'm just dictating here with this restriction the, um, the behavior, yeah. right? Okay. So I'm not coming, let's say I, I don't have an uncertainty set where I can collapse one of the random variables or I cannot one hyperplane to it. So this is a very, if you like, it's a restrictive assumption. So I'm not considering all possible decision dependent on certain cases. So this is a somewhat restrictive assumption that fits within the three applications that I present. Okay. Merv had also a question about yeah. the EMM. Uh, I might have missed it. I didn't have a chance to think, but I was wondering whether convergence directly applies, especially when you apply the decision rules. I think it might go through, but. Yeah, it's a, it's a convex problem. Yeah. So everything is convex. Um, probably you need something on the objective. I, I guess there are versions in uh, Professor Boyd's uh, um, tutorial on how to deal with linear objectives as well. Uh, so in our numericals, it, uh, it converges. OK? Nice. Thanks. Uh, Otherwise, there's a Shenan Zhu who has a yep. question in the chat, but maybe wants to. Can we do an inverse optimization assuming the unknown problem has some constraints are similar with a known problem as well as some other uncertain constraints? I feel like a sort of competing companies are probably doing this and they share some similarities in their model. Yes, a great question. So, we do consider the case where some of the constraints are known. Interestingly, that part actually creates some complications. And the reason is, um, is that essentially you have this constraint intersection, the known constraint. 
And uh, in that case, there are some complications uh, to it. It, uh, it appears here, actually. If you have known constraints, when you try to dualize this constraint, uh, it, uh, it gives us a bit of problem. But you can move these known constraints outside. And um, essentially, you can ask that these uncertain constraints are within the known constraints. So you can essentially impose this constraint, right? This extra constraint, the, um, this G is in the, it's a, a subset of the known constraints. And essentially you ensure that you have also the known constraints in the problem. Uh, it gets a bit more difficult there, I have to admit, but um, you're right. So it's possible that someone that has known constraints can deal with them as well. It's an, it's an interesting aspect because when you adapt the uncertainty set, often there's an underlying support that is a physical support that you would want to intersect with. Huh? Yeah. And, and yeah. right now, maybe you, you cannot handle that. You, well, you can, we can handle it. Um, essentially, there is an, you can do the following. You can add an additional constraint that you require that this G is inside, it's a subset of the known constraints. Right? Yeah, that would be different. Yeah. 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 Uh, so next, uh, Uda is saying, thanks, thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, I don't think that comes with a question, but then we can have his uh, raised hand for a while. So yeah. uh, thanks, Angelos. It was a really nice talk. And I have several questions. So. Uh, Actually, um, first of all, I we know that in linear quadratic control problems, uh, affine policies can be shown to be optimal. And did you try to, I mean, show for when there this problem has like F, like uncertainty and that too, uh, this uh, decision dependent uncertainty, uh, can we show that um, li linear policies could be optimal? And this is also related to the third part of your talk on inverse optimization, because if I know that I am, I am searching in the space of uh, linear policies uh, and um, uh, if the if, and I am looking for quadratic optim uh, like solutions for let's like, suppose quadratic objectives then uh, could I recover exactly and uniquely the 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 structure of the problems basically so let me tell you that I have no idea okay. uh, about uh, how to answer this so I can tell you first of all that uh, in principle, well, uh, affine decision rules are optimal for unconstrained systems. So you only have the linear dynamics, but you don't really have constraints in your problem. So you have a quadratic objective, right? And there you can uh, you can solve the problem. Yes. So once you start having constraints, things are not uh, linear decision rules are not optimal anymore. And I think this is what's going to happen here. Perhaps I'm wrong, by the way. But essentially, if I come to my simple problem here, uh, let's assume that I don't have this constraint here and I don't have this constraint here. I'm going to introduce a constraint on X and possibly this one will cause problems. But I haven't thought about it. It's a good, it's a good question. Thanks. With regards to your inverse optimization, to be honest, I didn't quite get it. Can you repeat it? Oh, oh I see. Uh, that you can recover different problems uh, from uh, from an inverse optimization problem. Like the true, the original problem would not be identical to the recovered problem. Now, the question would be whether you can establish some form of uniqueness, like in cer certain classes of problems, whether you could come up with unique solutions and uh, through inverse optimization. So I was looking for like some structure in the original problem itself so that the recovered problem is indeed uh, equal to the original problem. So That's a very good uh, suggestion for us to look at. Uh, already here, you see that the recovered solution is completely different from the original network. Uh, mm -hmm. Very good idea. I have no idea, but this is a good question. To like a, something like a linear program? with K constraints that you could recover if you have a projection of a simplex in K dimension or whatever, yes. <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Mm. So this one actually, 
this recovers the unique solution in some sense. Um, but I, I, that's a good point. Uh, I will discuss it with my co-hosts and see if we can get something. Thanks. I have one more question. Uh, can I ask? I would have been offended if you didn't. <laughs> So, uh, so here you assume that uh, the network operator is not in the, in the first part of your talk. Uh, you assume that the the building is deciding on this selecting the set W. Now this this uh, is quite closely related to preference elicitation also because a network operator can sit with the uh, with the building and and try to see the risk that uh, the risk uh, that uh, a building is allowed to take. In terms of proposing the W, so as to tune this W in such a way that uh, the network operator, like somebody, doesn't propose too high a W, which can be very detrimental to the to the operations of the network operator. Do you think there could be some connection? Between... Why why would a big W be detrimental for the operator? The actual the operator wants a big W. Because uh, the, if if it has a big W, it's essentially it has more capacity, more flexibility to balance the the network, right? Could could it always be met? This is why I was concerned. I mean, like in real world applications, proposing a W and then satisfying the constraints, could it be like I could when I'm proposing a W, I I'm choosing this W basically, right? And and and, and then I don't know whether these constraints could be met. Like exactly or not, right? So that's why I, in the optim in the optimization choosing the W, it's a it's actually a multi-stage problem, right? Yes. So here you are kind of simulating what would potentially happen throughout the day, right? And you are saying yes. if I have this W, this is the cost that I will recover throughout the day. If I have this W, this is the cost, and so on. So you are getting a W such that you ensure that you are feasible for all possible things that the operator could ask from you. So this is like selling insurance. Think about it. Mm -hmm. I, I am the insurance company. I can sell, you know, huge amounts of insurance. But then when accidents start happening, I better make sure that the amount of insurance that I have will, uh, will be satisfied. Okay. I have to interrupt uh, the discussion and ask that we pursue this in a breakout room after the talk. So th thanks again, Angelos, for the great presentation. It's very inspiring.